Hello and welcome to this revision podcast on the economy between 1881 to 1905. First of all, the background. The uh, revival of the economy had begun under Alexander II as a response to the Crimean War. But backwardness of agriculture still meant that Russia was looking for other sources of wealth. After emancipation, where everything had been paid for in kind or traded, there was now a need for a money and cash based economy. Reuton had done a lot of good work and the emancipation had removed one barrier to industrialization, but the mere was still there restricting movement and uh, movement to the towns and cities and industrial investment was very slow. The main aims for the state at this time were to develop its military potential. A growing industry would mean better weapons and ships, etc. The military needed industrialization and that meant that industrialization was state-led and this is also due to the lack of entrepreneurial spirit in Russia meaning that individuals weren't necessarily going to lead the industrialization. There was some railway building and a limited spread of factories, some state-owned armament businesses and there was some foreign investment but they were still way behind Western Europe. Russia was not living up to its huge potential in 1881, given the amount of resources and manpower, whereas Britain and Germany particularly had pressed on and become even more industrialised. However, the size of Russia, the mistrust of a landless proletariat by the autocracy, and a lack of general entrepreneurial class would make this a very difficult task. The work of Bungi, 1881-86. He was Minister of Finance in this period and wanted to modernise the economy. His priority was to control expenditure to create financial stability and attract foreign investment. He consolidated the banking system and founded the Peasants Land Bank. The Land Bank was equipped with funds and land to make more of it, more of both, available to peasants. And this was often state land. And the 4% interest rates were really low. He reduced the burden of tax on the peasantry with his tax reforms. For example, he abolished poll tax and inheritance tax was introduced. He introduced first ever Russian labour laws, but he used protectionist policies, restraining trade through tariffs. He resigned because of a deficit in the budget. And under Bungie, there had been no clear plan or strategy for industrial development. The work of Vishnogradsky, 1887-92, His main priority was to increase taxes to create financial stability and attract foreign investment. He strove to improve finances by building up the gold reserves of Russia and he increased indirect taxes and mounted a drive to increase grain exports. He reduced imports by raising tariffs just like Bungie before him. For example, the Tariff Act 1891 or the Great Protective Tariff of 1891. This protected Russia's iron iron industry, machinery, and cotton industries from foreign competition. Tariffs rose to 33% by 1891, but this did increase government revenue because they got the money from the tariffs. He negotiated loans, for example from the the French in 1888, to kickstart growth. And this appeared successful. Between 1881 and 91, grain exports rose by 18%, and he solved the budget deficit, and therefore Russia was in surplus of money. But the peasants bore the brunt of the indirect taxation, reducing their purchasing power. The price of goods rose because of the tariffs. And, most of all, their grain was being taken to sell abroad, which meant that they were all extremely hungry and even starving. Vishnogradsky himself said, We ourselves will not eat, but we will export. Maybe he didn't actually not eat though, it was mainly the peasants. Um, So these are the starvation exports. They were selling grain abroad despite the domestic need for it. Um, And this was to pay for the industrial raw materials needed uh, for the machines that Russia was staking its future on. So therefore it led to the 1891 famine for which Vishnogradsky was dismissed in order so that Vita could come in and replace him. And there was still no clear plan for industrialization. The work of Vitter, 1892 to 1903, known as the Great Spurt. 
Vista's main contribution was the fir- first far-sighted coherent program for industrial growth. Vita was totally committed to economic modernization, as it was, in his opinion, the only way to save Russia's great power status. Russia would become a colony like China, a vast market that couldn't supply its own needs and was therefore dependent on its neighbours' handouts if it didn't mo- modernise. Plus, Russia was coming late to the game and it could get the newest up-to-date technologies. It would curb revolutionary activity if everybody was well off and rich, they were less likely to revolt. Vita basically agreed with Vishnagrasky's policies but had a mo- co- more coherent plan. He identified three main problems. 1. Insufficient capital 2. Lack of managerial and technical expertise 3. Insufficient manpower in the right areas Towns Industrialisation needed to be directed from above due to lack of business class State capitalism this is called However there was a huge increase in private investors in this period as well Witter persuaded the foreign powers not to offload their goods onto the um, huge market of Russia but to invest in new industries The government raised loans for railways and invested in taxes in other industries. They did continue protectionism, grain exports um, going out and the high taxes that Vishnogradsky had introduced. Uh, There was a shortage of capital that led to more loans from abroad. Importantly, the Russian currency, the ruble, was put on the gold standard and a new ruble uh, was introduced and linked to it in 1897 which was to stabilise the currency and raise interest rates to encourage foreign investment. It seemed to work, although again, prices did rise. Much of the foreign investment mainly came from France, but also from the UK and Germany, amongst others, and this mostly went into mining metals, um, extracting oil, and it also went into banking. So therefore, Russia was forced into industrialisation, especially in heavy industry. Foreign workers and experts came in from Western Europe to advise. In 1897, Vita put in some social policies, such as limiting working hours and even permitting trade unions. Railways were the key to development. In the mid-1890s, 60% of the railway system was state-owned, as the state had begun to buy up private-owned railway companies in the 1880s. There was a massive increase in the amount of track which opened up the interior of Russia for development. These are areas that couldn't be navigated by road or canal, for example the Ukraine iron and coal industries and the development of the oil industry on the Caspian Sea. And these were two main reasons for the overall economic growth of Russia. This stimulated heavy industry in order to build them. Railway construction accounted for 60% of iron and steel bought in Russia by the 1890s. The cotton trade also benefited as new areas of raw cotton and new markets in Asia were found. They reduced the cost of transport and therefore had a knock-on effect in reducing the prices of goods. Government made money on the fares, which meant that they had more money to invest elsewhere in the industry. The Trans-Siberian Railway was a propaganda success and made people feel good about Russia. Heavy industry. In the early 1880s, light industry such as textiles had led the way. Focus on heavy industry reduced the gap. By 1897, Russia was the world's fourth biggest industrial economy, with a faster growth rate in the 1890s than anyone. However, since it started from a really small base, it wasn't very hard to grow quickly. There's a boost to trade, but mainly they were still selling grain, not industrial goods, and they were also still falling short of Witter's predictions. The problems. Witter was not liked or trusted at court or in the government, and he was never supported properly and forced to resign in 1903. The Trans-Siberian Railway drained finances and wasn't actually finished by 1914, and there was an overestimation of it and its Uh, benefits in the Russo-Japanese war. There's a high dependence on foreign loans and an uneven geographical spread of development. There was a neglect of domestic industry and light industry and there was a neglect of agriculture and agrarian modernisation. This industrialisation 
also caused huge social problems. For example, the rise of a new middle class, factory owners, factory managers or bankers and doctors and teachers who often became members of the Zemstva and then sometimes even revolutionary leaders when they realised they would have no voice in central government. The urban working class developed. Urban population quadrupled from between 1867 and 1917. They lived and worked in terrible conditions and often became open to Marxist ideas. Wages did not rise with inflation. They suffered from disease and brutality from their bosses. Strikes most of the time were banned. Conditions were the worst between 1900 and 1908 during the Industrial Recession. The Great Spirit in Russia was not isolated to that country. It was linked to a worldwide boom. Trade recession set in in 1900. The consequences for Russia and ill-cared-for industrial workers were particularly bad. It led to the 1905 revolution. The neglect of agriculture. Agriculture provided the livelihood for 90% of Russian people. There's an assumption that peasants could simply produce more by being forced, which is wrong. It was ignored agriculture and its development in favour of industrial growth. The peasants were still tied to the mere by redemption payments, and bread prices were kept down in good years of harvest so the income stayed low. In poor years they starved, the famous one in 1891, but also in 1898 and 1901. Population explosion undermined the emancipation UK and its results, and inefficient farming methods were still prevalent, mainly due to strip farming still being used, and this was made even worse by the population growth. The mere hampered output as did suspicion of Western farming methods, not leaving fields fallow, etc., and enclosure. The lack of direct investment in farming, as imposed to industry, really hurt them, and Russia was producing a quarter of the grain and the same amount of land that Britain would do. So if you had an, an acre of land, Britain would produce four times as much grain in that land. All this led to rises in... in um, Peasants getting behind in taxation and in their redemption payments. The richest and the poorest peasants became, the gap between them became wider. The kulaks were up, upwardly mobile, uh, but the really, real poorest peasants um, got worse. They were left landless and some of them became migrants. A few went to Siberia under the Resettlement Bureau, but not enough, only 750,000. Land banks sometimes helped, but also they increased debts. So living standards varied. The worst was in the Russian heartlands, which coincidentally were those who supported the Bolsheviks in 1917. Well, not so coincidentally. 1901-1902 saw serious crop failures and led to the years of the Red Cockerel, the worst social unrest since the 1860s in rural Russia. And this led, partly, to the 1905 revolution as well. The overall impression was that there was impressive growth, but it was still the least developed European power by 1905.